Hello and welcome to this afternoon's BFI Film Academy Lab on First Jobs and CVs. Thanks so much for coming this afternoon. It's the first in our autumn series and we're really excited to kickstart with this session that really is the subtext of most BFI labs that we run at, um, at the Young Film Programmers Network. So this really is a great opportunity to be a little bit more explicit and direct and focus on that subject for the whole hour. My name's Julia Andrews Clifford, and I am the Young Film Programmers Network Manager. And it's um, my pleasure to introduce today's session. My pronouns are she or her. And are, for those who'd like a visual description, I am a white middle-aged woman. I've got long brownish blondish hair, and I'm wearing a black polar neck and purple glasses. And BFI Film and Academy Labs are designed for 16 to 25 year olds to find out industry insights and professional expertise to help further and support their filmmaking and film programming practices. And so in today's session, the first half will be an interview between our guests, but the second half is your chance to interview them yourself. So in the Q&A function, please, as soon as you have a question, pop it in there. And after uh, the first half hour at five o'clock, we will hand over to your questions and I will be fielding them to our two guests. Um, so to welcome to the session and get cracking on, it is a great pleasure to invite Kate Wood to finally come on one of our BFI labs. She's been on our list for a long time and She's a real inspiration for young film programmers because as a relatively young programmer still, um, she started out as a young film programmer in the Brighton area and has now risen to a program coordinator at the Broadway Cinema in Nottingham. So hi Kate, really great to see you today. I don't know if you're gonna come up yet. I can't see you. Um, I can't start my video because David has stopped it. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, <laughs> um, I'll, I will, ah, yeah, great, you're there. I'm not talking to a black screen anymore. Hello, <laughs> welcome. Um, thank you, David. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Kate Wood. I work at Broadway Cinema in Nottingham, as Julia just said. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and for uh, if anyone needs a visual description, I have short, dark hair. I'm wearing tortoiseshell glasses. I'm a white woman. I am, I guess I am relatively a young programmer, but I'm not, uh, if you ask the BFI, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting in front of some shelves with some files on it and a neon green poster and bits on the wall. Amazing. Nice to be here. Thank you and thanks for coming. So excited to have you share your career journey today and also talk a little bit about CVs, interviews and how you might actually succeed in your first job. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand, out, hand over to Jay, but before I do, say a little bit about Jay. And I don't know if we can see Jay, but that would be great. But um, Jay Taylor-Jones is our Young Film Programmer presenter today. And a little bit about Jay. So Jay has just started as a film student at the Arts University in Bournemouth, or Arts University Bournemouth. I hope I've got that right. And uh, not only that, but as a filmmaker, he, they, sorry, was also um, a young programmer in Lewis in the Southeast at Depot Cinema, as well as getting the first job at a production company as a camera operator and researcher. So it's quite exciting that you both, you know, Jay's starting out on the journey, but has had first job, second job, third job. And Kate, I don't know how many jobs you've had, but it, there are similarities <laughs> with your journey. So in the Q&A section, I'll be hitting you both with some of those questions about the CVs and the interview tips. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jay. Wonderful, thank you, Julia. Uh, hello, my name is Jay Taylor-Jones. My pronouns are they, them. For those who need an audio, dis an audio description, a visual description, um, I am a white young person. I've got messy brown hair. 
I'm wearing a lot of eyeliner and I'm in a room covered in posters. Uh, so without further ado, Kate, as Julia said, it's fantastic to have you here, especially as we are on very similar pathways. Um, like me, um, many of the audience members will be in their first jobs or they'll be looking to get their first jobs. Um, and we'll be looking to get from entry level up to a position that is probably on par with where you are today. So could you show us or tell us a bit about what you do at the moment? So my current job is, um, my title is Cinema Programme Coordinator at Broadway. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Broadway is a four screen independent cinema in Nottingham. We um, screen a mix of new release titles, um, repertory titles on re-release. Um, we do quite a lot of rep programming separate to that, so special seasons and events. Um, and we also host um, touring programmes, so London Film Festival. Um, just next month, we've got the UK Jewish Film Festival, we've got Queer East Film Festival. So we host a lot of um, incoming tours as well. Um, and we have a horror film festival that happens every year in October that's produced um, by, a, by the festival team who work very closely with us. Um, and that's going into its 18th edition. So there's a lot going on. And that's just kind of like, that's just what we've got coming up in the next couple of months. So there's, you know, it's a real mix. Um, and my role is to work with the programme director on the new releases. So that's deciding what we show how often we show it, whether we're going to show it on date or off date. Um, and then I also work on those uh, special events that I mentioned. So working with those programme partners to choose what from their tours we're going to show. And um, yeah, and then working on creating bespoke seasons and events in-house at Broadway as well. So that's a bit of an overview. If you want any, if you, you know, if there's anything you want to ask specifically about that to answer questions it's quite a lot there <laughs> there's loads there yeah, yeah. there's a lot <laughs> that you always wanted to do film programming um no not because i want not because i necessarily wanted to do something else but just because i wasn't entirely sure what i wanted to do and i wasn't mm -hmm. really aware that that was a thing that you could do or that i could do it seemed very remote and um and, and hard to get into as a as a role so I actually started working at Broadway when I was a teenager. I got a job ushering at Broadway um, and I, I haven't been there this whole time. I, I have come back a number of years later. But yeah, I had this stint working there when I was a teenager and it, it fell when I finished my art foundation year. And then I decided that I didn't want to go and do art at university as I kind of always thought that I would. Um, so I just was ushering at the cinema and I was doing that full time and all I was doing was watching movies and I was like how do I can I just do that is that a thing that I can do just carry on watching movies thinking about movies so I went to university to study film I did film theory rather than film production um, and then yeah it just kind of that's kind of how I got my foot in the door, which is I think how a lot of people get their foot in the door, which is just tearing tickets and watching a bunch of films. Yeah. yeah. Did you know at that point what film programming was, what it involved, um, what would appeal to you eventually? Yeah, I I knew that in the in our venue we had a film programmer and there was someone who was choosing those films, but um, there wasn't as much at that point as there is now um, about trying to, like there, there weren't sessions like this happening that I was able to go to. So it, that's what I mean when I say it felt very remote. It felt like the films come down from somewhere above in you know, a management position somewhere, someone's making those decisions, I guess. And then here they are, they arrive in the cinema. Um, so yeah, I didn't know how you get there. Um, so it wasn't until I had worked at um, a couple of cinemas in Brighton, well, the, technically the same, Duke of York's and Dukes at Comedia, I was working there when I was at university, and they weren't showing the kinds of films that I wanted to go and see. So I was like, 
I'll start putting films on. And that's kind of how I got into film programming. But I thought of it less as being a film programmer, more I'm just putting on, I'm just hosting pop up film screenings. Um, so it took a while for me to sort of feel confident saying, I am a programmer. I, this is what I do. Because at the beginning, it just felt like I was messing around and kind of having fun. And that didn't, wasn't necessarily something you could call a job because no one was paying me to do it. I was just doing it off my own back. So, yeah. yeah. That, that sounds, it's a perfect opportunity. I think that's what many of us would like as, as the first thing mm -hmm. to really get us going. How did that come about? How did you find that as something that you could be doing? So I was working at a small independent theatre and on Sunday nights and Monday nights, the theatre was dark, which means they didn't, they didn't have any performances happening. Um, so I thought, we've got this space, I work there, I'm not going to have to pay um, venue hire fees. So maybe I could start putting films on. And I got in touch actually with Film Hub Southeast and I said, I want to start putting films on. How on earth do I start doing that? And they gave me a huge amount of support and advice about um, where I could borrow the screening equipment from. So literally like the projector, the screen. Um, and they also pointed me in the direction of the independent cinema office. And I actually did a, um, a course, it was called Practical Programming. It's a six month course with two weekends at either end of the six months with a bunch of sessions from industry experts, and then during that six month period, we needed to um, run our own project and that was supported. We were supported with a mentor during that period. And then we came back at the end and all fed back to each other about how it had all gone. Um, and that was really invaluable in terms of just telling me how on earth you actually start programming. You know, where do you what are film rights, how do, what do you have to do, what permissions do you have to do to get, to put films on and, and how are you gonna get, how do you then tell people that you're putting this film on, how do you get audiences in? It was, um, yeah, it was a really, really invaluable experience. They really took care of me. So that's how, yeah, that's how I started. Wonderful. And these pop-up screenings, um, mm -hmm. how did you start to decide what you'd program? How would, or how was your first job as a programmer? Um, how did that work? How did you decide, I'm gonna show this? Yeah, so we decided that um, it was me and one other person um, who did everything. So from uh, choosing the films to creating the marketing materials, you know, we made a website. Um, yeah, the whole, the whole thing was us. Um, so we decided that we needed um, something to hang it around. We know we wanted to do rep screenings of like cult and queer classics, basic, basically. But we decided rather than just having a, um, just saying that that's what we're gonna do and they're just gonna be kind of random films. We wanted to have a, a through line to them. So something that felt like we could, that, so that they spoke to each other in some way. So the, the Strand the pop-up club was called Dreamland Cinema and all the films we chose were either dreamy or nightmarish. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how well they all really hung together, but they felt like they kind of, they did to us. Yeah, um, they were good yeah. films. Yeah, yeah, they were all films we wanted to show and they all had a kind of like... Um, something to them. So they were all films that were going to look really good on the big screen. So they were, they felt like, or maybe they had like, um, they were going to work well for a collective experience. So, so we were really programming with the, with the experience of the audience in mind. Um, yeah. So that's kind of, that's, yeah, where that's the point that we started from. Yeah. Wonderful. And were they, did they go down well? Were they well attended? They did. They went down really, really well, actually. And people always ask, how did you get so many people to come to stuff? Because they, they really were kind of, it was kind of spooky. They just straight out the gate, people responded really, really well. And I wish I had um, 
I wish I had some like clearer advice. I'd say if you do X, then loads of people will come to your screenings. But I think what it was was that we were just really, 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 it sounds cheesy, but we were just really passionate about what we were doing. And I think because we wanted to convey that feeling that we had about these films to the audience, um, I think people really responded to that. So um, yeah, we created, for all our screenings, we created little fold out program notes that I designed um, and we gave those away. Don't we? Sorry? I believe we've got pictures of them. We do have some pictures of them. If David could put them up on screen, that'd be great. Um, Yeah, we had these little program notes. So the picture there of Debbie Harry's head cut out, that's the front of one of the program notes and that folded out and that's um, from our first screening of Videodrome. Um, And behind it is a flyer for the next film that we showed, which was Heavenly Creatures. So we did these kind of like very DIY aesthetic um, marketing materials. And we also gave out badges at all the screenings. So that's Kate Winslet's head from Heavenly Creatures. and then later on, I we got some funding from the hub actually, and we were able to pay a friend of mine who is um, an artist and illustrator, and she made these incredible limited edition posters for us. And they were all riso printed and like really, really gorgeous posters that we sold as prints at the screenings. Um, and we also did um, special playlists for each film so that when people came in there was like music that felt like it went with the film and just trying to create a a really special experience for audiences that you can't replicate at home so that was kind of key and I think you know to be honest I think it's the badges I think people really really loved getting little badges so that's my like main marketing tip do little badges okay quite this i should make badges for your screenings yeah <laughs> how did you yeah. use all of this um experience going forward because obviously you had this huge um well you were a programmer straight out the gate you were programming your own films for quite a sizable audience how did you then present all of this experience to potential um or, or to jobs that you're applying to how how did you use that that it's a really good question because I didn't entirely know how to um present what I had done I I felt like a bit of a fraud presenting what I'd done via dreamland um because it didn't feel like it wasn't a job as I said no one was paying me so I so uh, it took me a while to feel comfortable including it on my cv and telling people look I've done all of these things but it, it's a job in the same I created the job for myself yeah. um so yeah and and it really it it kind of put me on the radar of people of other organizations in Brighton basically so at this time I was also volunteering for Sydney City the Brighton Film Festival and um yeah Tim who is the director of the of that festival Um, he knew me from volunteering but then I could also point to the screenings that I had done and it's hard to get you know because sorry so a job was advertised for the Brighton Film Festival and I think if I hadn't done the Dreamland stuff I would have really struggled to get that job because I didn't have any other experience beyond volunteering for the festival which is great puts you on their radar but it is an actual you know experience of putting film events on so I think I would have really struggled to get that first job if I hadn't have had that pop-up DIY experience so yeah I did have to start presenting that as as I would anything else on my CV and I think that's right those kinds of jobs those kinds of events that you put on under your own steam that's as that's as meaningful and as valuable as any other work that you can be doing so yeah it's just about having the confidence to present it in that way I think yeah and for for the young programmers in the audience would you recommend that they start putting this on their cv too that this is a big thing that they could be selling themselves for 
yeah I think definitely when whenever people ask me what how do I get into film programming how do I get into film exhibition I mean just start doing it essentially don't wait until someone asks you to do it just start doing it um it's really hard work um I mean you're literally if you're doing it on the scale that I was doing it you're like putting out chairs in venues and you know lugging projectors around and stuff it's it's hard but it's really 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 fun and then you have your own experience and you're working out for yourself what what works what's what's landing with audiences what isn't landing with audiences um what do I like showing what am I interested in um yeah and then tell people you've done it because you've done it it's it's and it's really impressive I think it when I when yeah I come across young programmers who are doing this kind of thing themselves under their own steam now um I'm so impressed by by kind of if for nothing else the chutzpah of just like taking up some space and telling people yeah my ideas are as good as anyone else's and I'm gonna put something on myself so yeah I definitely think just go ahead start doing it and then tell people that you did it yeah what, what about finding that first job uh, because if you've got all of this experience you're putting on all of these screenings that's fantastic but how would you go about finding the jobs that may not be advertised on the usual like indeed um mm -hmm. Are they a bit more hidden? Well, I think one of the things is, as I as I said, I, I was volunteering for the festival before I got the job there. Um, and I was also doing some other bits and pieces of volunteering at the time as well. So I, yeah, I did some volunteering for um, Flair, the BFI's Queer Film Festival, and at Fabrica Gallery. I was a gallery assistant for a bit, just in a voluntary role. Um, I did some volunteering for the horror festival that we run in Nottingham actually and you know I think volunteering is a really really good way of not only gaining some experience for you in terms of getting to see inside of organizations and then within that who works there what do they do what does it look like what does a day-to-day -day kind of look like here because obviously you're not doing all of those things at in, within that volunteering capacity you don't have much you know you're not going to have loads of responsibilities but you get to see what other people are doing I think that's really invaluable but also you're then on that organization's radar so if a job comes up then you can point to that thing that you've already done for them and hopefully they'll recognize you and if you were really engaged and switched on and smart and asked questions and were as helpful as you could be and create create that memory for them then I think that's a really helpful tool then when you're applying for stuff um, but in terms of looking for the jobs a lot of it is yeah if you're already you know if you know people then they will tell you if something's coming up or they'll tell you oh something I heard they're looking for a job at a, you know someone I know and people will start like people will start to think of you for things if you have made yourself known um, at that kind of volunteer level and then just also just tell people you're looking for a job I think that's really really helpful if if people know that you're looking then they will think of you yeah yeah it's more about who knows you rather than who you know sort of thing yeah 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 that's actually a really good way of of putting it because you have but you have to make sure that you've done something that will make them remember you you know yeah. you kind of can't just turn up to volunteering things and be really quiet and not you have to kind of get out there and like yeah. talk just talk to everyone and don't be annoying don't ask too many questions but you know be engaged and then yeah I think people really respond to that being brave enough not to stay in your lane and to drive into another and yes definitely drive into safely drive into other lanes yeah. check, check check all your mirrors and then drive into those lanes yeah yes and in your experience how or when did you realize that you could drive into that other lane so to speak 
That's really difficult because um, I think I imagine a lot of people listening what may also have this, but imposter syndrome is a real, that's a real thing when you're first starting out. So yeah, when I had done these screenings and I'd done a bit of volunteering and I'd done some like, I, get, I gave the festival, I did some like marketing support for them just on a freelance basis one year. And then the next when an actual job came up, I was really like, I, this is my first real role and do they know that I don't really have that much experience and I've only just I've only put on a few screenings here and there and um but you have to trust that um other people the people who are hiring you they they know what they're looking for and for a lot of those entry-level jobs you don't need to hit all of the things on the job spec you don't need to have done all of them because I think if you, in arts organizations, you're often, if you're, you know, if you're hiring those entry level, first time job kind of roles, you want to give someone a, a foot, a leg up. So I guess, yeah, up. it's really, it's really, really difficult, but you do have to just be confident in yourself and take, take some risks apply for stuff and also know that you might not get it but if they've seen your name apply for other stuff in the past and then you maybe apply again for something else because you didn't get it then that's good you're on their radar they know who you are they know your name and they know that you're committed to to working in the industry so you might not get your first the first thing that you apply for but that's okay that's okay how would you go about dealing with not getting it? It was there points in your yeah. I mean, not getting yeah. As I've just said, not getting it. It's really rough when you. I mean, I I did actually apply for a role at Cine City before that I didn't get. Um, yeah, so I it was like a, maybe a couple of years before I actually got a job there. I applied and it was really like I didn't have much experience at that point and. I was really like, oh, I'm just going to chuck in an application and see what happens. And I didn't get it. Um, but you kind of have to not feel too embarrassed, not feel like, oh, God, that means that this isn't right. And I can't ever apply for that place again because they know that I applied and I didn't get that job. And that's embarrassing. Whatever. You just have to get over all of that. And I think. go, Just go again, <laughs> just keep going again, because it's quite quite a competitive industry and you you being realistic you probably won't get the first job you apply for but you might get the second or the third and it's just about being resilient I think yeah yeah well just looking at the time you've given us some fantastic information and I've learned a lot um but I'm wondering whether we have any questions from the audience so I'll pass back over to Julia Okay, well, it is five o'clock. You're very good on the timings. We have got some questions, but I know that um, you had a few more questions. So I think we've got four questions. So put your questions in the Q&A. We can go back to a few more of your questions, Jay, if you want, because we've got a little bit more time, I would say. But um, do you want to, or should we go to the floor? Should we hear some from the floor first? Okay. So, um, there, you touched on, I think it was um, really interesting what you talked about the language. So, like you said, um, you know, when the theatre goes dark, you know, which is like, a, it's not jargon or but landing with the audience. And there's a question here which kind of chimes in with that. And I guess that also might help you if you start knowing the language that will help you in your, in, you know, your letter and your interview and things. But we've got, um, a question what does on and off date mean oh great question you know and I think it's really hard because when you start when you start in any role and I, I imagine in any job you have no idea what anyone's talking about because they all use loads of abbreviations acronyms and it's very annoying so you have to just ask because people forget that not everyone knows this kind of stuff so thank you for asking um, on date and off date uh, refers to new release films. So films that are coming out now, we call those new releases, kind of obvious, but I just want to make sure everyone knows that. Um, 
And then you can either play those on date, so literally the, the first date that they're available to screen in a cinema, or you can choose to show them off date, which is later. So distributors, the distributor that's putting that film out, if you're showing a film on date, they'll have a higher requirement of um, screening slots that they'll need you to do and the terms will be higher so you'll have to pay more for the film basically so they might say yes you can play it in the first week that it's out but we'll need you to play it in all the all the slots that you have available for that for that film um, and we'll need you to play it in our biggest screen or whatever and then as it gets further away from the date that it was released they'll be more flexible with the terms so they can so they'll say, yeah, you can just show it once a day or you can show it for three days instead of for a full week. Um, and it might be cheaper for you to screen it. So, yeah, you have to kind of decide whether you want a film the day that it's opening so that everyone, you know, they're seeing those releases in the weekend papers and they want to go and see that film that weekend at your venue or whether you want to show it a little bit later. And sometimes that can actually be beneficial for a film because some of those smaller films sometimes require a little bit of word of mouth so they want to see more you want the audience to have seen more reviews had a bit more exposure to it you know heard whatever filmmaker on a, a few more podcasts or whatever and then it'll hit your screen a few weeks later a couple of weeks later and they'll be a bit more aware of it um so it's just about making it's kind of case by case basis of of what you think for each film so yeah Brilliant. And I think, you know, also part of your job is working with the programme director on the mm. new release strategy, as yeah. well as special events. And it's interesting that yeah. like, lots of young programmers will think about rep, you know, yeah. 20 years, you know, and thinking of things like that. But actually a big yeah. meat of your job is the new release strategy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of my role is, yeah, looking at what's coming out the following month working out what we want to show because more films come out every week than we have space to show in our venue. And then, you know, there's quite a lot of admin about like creating all that copy, putting it all on a website. You know, it's, it's not all, it's not all glam. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So, you know, and that might be the next step as a young programmer is to start learning about that and potentially yeah. programming, working with your cinemas, what are the new releases coming out and choosing from those and you know mm. we talked about audience figures I and mean, it's not guaranteed presumably with new releases but it does help <laughs> because yeah. no one's seen it before and there's a it helps with all the marketing that is going on nationally as well okay brilliant all right we've got a question more focusing on cvs now and we kind of didn't quite get to it but um there was a question from jay that he was going to ask which is how did you sell yourself in your applications? And there's another question from Alexander Sternberg. How did you structure your CV cover letters when applying for these entry level programmer jobs? So how did I apply? How did I structure the cover letters? Well, it looks like both. Both. So well, CV we do. And a cover letter. We do have a slide that has a picture yes, that has um. You could see my CV if you want to. You won't be able to read all of it because it's quite small. This David, is, if you could... Great. Can if I you just could... say this is great that Kate is sharing this because there's a certain... Um, it's so embarrassing. People have about sharing their CV. It really it is. is. About selling. It really is. is. Yeah, <laughs> it is quite cringy sharing your CV. Um, so hopefully you can't sort of read too much <laughs> about what I've said here. But this is, this is what my CV looks like. And when I was first applying for jobs, I asked a friend of mine to send me her CV because I was like, what does a CV look like? Where do you put everything? What order do you put everything? And, and how do you write about your experience? And I was actually just saying to Julia and Jay earlier today that I, looking back at this now, because this is from when I applied to my last job last year, um, I would actually cut down loads of this now like each so basically I've got my experience which is just all the jobs that I've had and then dreamland is under projects um, um education and then professional training so that's like courses that I've taken for work um but each of these paragraphs that I've got on this cv I cut them down by maybe half because I think this is too much information um but yeah in terms of how to structure 
but this is how I lay this out. But in terms of how to structure a cover letter, that's a really good question. Um, and yeah, I actually, my partner and I, whenever we're applying for a new job, and you do, it doesn't need to be applying, it could be your friend, whoever, parent, whatever, get someone to read it for you always so you work on the letter so she and I do this for each other always when we're applying for a, a new role I'll write something or she'll write something if she's applying for something um and then I'll show it to her and she'll look through it and she'll be like you have not been you know you haven't been confident enough you haven't been you know I can't get a sense of who you are in this letter you need to redo this you need to do this because it's really really hard to do that for yourself because I think if you're anything like me, your inclination is to be like, oh, I did some of these things and some of them were quite good and they went okay. And then she'll say to me, no, they were brilliant. You did a really brilliant job. You need to, you know, tell people that. So I think my first tip would be get someone to work on it with you and someone that you trust who's gonna be really honest. Um, and yeah, the other thing is don't just list stuff that you've done because that's what your CV is doing. You want to, in your cover letter, you want to convey something about who you are, what your personality is. You want to tell them something about you, not some, you know, it doesn't all need to be like work related as well. Obviously it needs to like link to the job that you're applying for, but like say what films you like, you know, you're applying for a job in film, tell people what you like, tell people who you are and what you're interested in. And, you know, having been on interview panels, God, there are some really boring cover letters and they all say the same thing and they'll say the same thing that their CV does. You know, you want to make it actually interesting and lively. That's kind of a bit of a boring word, but, you know, like fun to read. So, yeah, I'd say try and inject some of your personality into it. It's, a, it's really, really important, I think. I think that's really helpful. And it's interesting looking at it. We, It's very, yeah, like the CV is very professional. It's very straightforward. If you can get it on one side of A4, fantastic. Cut, yeah, cut it down, cut it down. <laughs> but, Less you know, you say that, it's a fine line. You know, maybe when you get into the third or fourth job, you mm. might feel you can do that more. But actually, if you've only got a couple of bits of experience, you might yeah, bulk, bulk it out. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, the cover letter, uh, I would say my own experience, um, I wrote quite a lot of cover letters. And then when I finally got a job at the BFI, British Film Institute, it was said that I was a bit over enthusiastic with my exclamation <laughs> marks. And I became a little bit of a joke, Aww. but I got the job. So it's like, that's an interesting one about at what point is it cringy and what point it's just, you, you've got to go for it. So it's such a fine line, but I, I think I'd rather go one too many exclamation points <laughs> than like something that feels dry and is just a list of, of what you've done. But also one, one last thing is, you wouldn't believe the amount of people who write cover letters and they're like, this will be really good for me in all of these ways. And this is my experience, blah, blah, blah. But they're, they're employing you. They want to know what, what is going to be good for them. So you have to say, these are the reasons for you why this is really good if you hire me. So don't forget that it's not just about, you know, you're like, I really need a job. I really want this job. But it's a two-way thing. And you need to remember that they they need to know why they're going to hire you as well. So yeah, and I think that's a really great thing as well, that remember, they need you. You know, yeah. I think that's something, that's something that Jay said earlier, you know, it's not who you know, it's yeah. who knows you. Yeah. And, you know, in this industry, they really need fresh, fresh ideas. Yeah. And so, yeah, like, don't always be the one cap in hand Yes, you know, it's it's a kind of fine line between arrogance and confidence. Yeah. But remembering that is important. Jay, quickly on yours, have you uh, your uh, cover letter for the production company for the filmmakers who might be watching? Do you remember what what worked on that for you? I mean, it was a Kickstarter, so they were yeah. obviously looking for young blood. 
Can you remember anything you'd like to comment? I think I just remember, I remember after submitting this letter thinking, oh, wow, that, that probably wasn't right because it was a lot of just passionate offload of, I really love this job with a little bit of, this is what I can do for you. But I remember thinking this, it's, it's just full of me and I'm not sure whether that's too much or not. I remember mentioning all of these filmmakers, these documentary makers that I, I adored. And I think that is in the end, what set me apart from everyone else is seeing what, seeing what I like and what I'm going to bring to the job with my taste. Uh, you, you want someone who's going to do it, but you also want someone who's going to be good in the team, good to talk to, who's not just going to be sat there. And, yeah. Actually, I think also that's a really, really good point is that people want to hire someone that's going to gel with the team. It's not only what your experience is. Um, it's also, are they going to be good to work with? So you want to kind of try and tell them a bit about you and what you'll be like in, in the office when you get there or on the set, wherever you are. Yeah. Uh -huh. Brilliant. So there's quite a few questions talking about getting that experience. And obviously, as a young programmer, that's one way of getting the experience if you've got a group nearby. Um, someone said, uh, Ceres or Keris, um, when do applications open for young programmers again? Depends where you are. So send in where you are and if there's a local one. But if there isn't a local one, do it yourself. And uh, we can help you with that as well, with lots of support and advice and resources. So you just have to send your email to us and we can, we can support you with that. But there's a couple of other questions that are on that subject about getting experience. So Ray Chung, I want to know in what way a student with no experience can find their first job in film. I mean, my question is, can you without experience? Question. I think that's when I would say, because, you know, I, I was a, a student with no experience, like we, we all start with no experience. So obviously, yes, you can get a job in the industry. But I think the thing that you need to start doing or what, what I started doing was volunteering. And that, that's different to like, I'm not suggesting go out and get an unpaid internship, but like you're a student. So you have long holidays, like use that time to volunteer for things that might be of interest and also just do that really widely you know I did as I was saying today I did like I was a gallery attendant um for a bit it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do but I met loads of really great people and um and then actually when I started running pop-up screenings I went back to that venue because they also run film events and I said can I do some film screenings here? And because they already knew who I was, they were like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. You know, I don't think it would have been as easy if I hadn't already been known to them. So I think if you don't have any experience, start getting some experience via volunteering because getting a job is hard, but applying to be a volunteer is not as hard. So that, that would be the, the, the kind of start putting the groundwork laying the groundwork. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, you know, and having some parameters for how long you're gonna volunteer. I think yeah. that's, you know, and you get out of it what you can, and you yeah. know you're not gonna be exploited by being in a job for over, you know, whatever. So you know what your boundaries are, you know what you wanna yeah. get out of it. And then it's, yeah. you know, I think yeah. again, yeah. let's quickly go to Jay, who obviously Young Programmers is a form of volunteering. But then you got a job at Depot Box Office and lots of our guests all seem to have got a job as uh, an usher at yeah. some point. I've had, I was an usher at the Odeon Leicester Square yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, so, and Kate was an usher when she was a teen at Broadway and Jay was not an usher, I think it was Box Office slash usher. But tell us a qu quickly, you know, how did the volunteering relate to getting that job and then on? I think it was pretty much the reason it was just showing that I had an interest in the industry going back to someone who may not have any experience you've got to make sure that whoever is going to be hiring you knows that you've got a very big interest a very big passion especially if you don't have 
any previous experience you've got to tell them somehow that you really want to work there and that's something that you're going to work very hard on um for getting my job uh, on the box office it was a case of just saying this is what i've done for the cinema in the past i i love this place you've got to sell that and sell your love of the workplace to them before you've even started working there um that's how i landed my job really and also you haven't mentioned but you ran a podcast and you did something like 12 sessions so all of that you know showed the passion it wasn't just doing the young programmers but it was in addition you were actually the kind of driving force and doing all of this stuff off your own back so you know you getting the experience and you're showing you're going to be a great asset you know but again you only did it for a year it's enough already you're not you know <laughs> yeah do I do I, never. yeah I think it's important because that just like really quickly to say that the arts is notorious for taking advantage of passion and there can be a real attitude of like we're all here because we love it so much and and that's like that's a, that's a different webinar to kind of really get into that but just to say like keep an eye out for volunteering opportunities that are not going to take advantage of you so when I was get volunteering at Fabrica that was a really within Brighton it's what really well known as a really good volunteering program and they take really good care of their volunteers give them a bunch of like you know perks and opportunities and stuff and then the other bits I was doing were for festivals so it has a, a limited it's time limited you know you go in you do a bunch of shifts um and then the festival's over so it, it doesn't become this big kind of thing that you feel required to spend loads of time whatever it's it's time limited so yeah do be careful but yeah I think it's a really good way of just seeing what's out there and what jobs look like yeah and that's great and also of course then the next day oh I think we've lost again, you again you know if you get caught in that forever you know you could end up being exploited that way but you know that is a, a way to get some paid work yeah and then that is you know paid work starts to show you're on the way to the entry level job etc Brilliant. Okay. So um, we've got another question. So there's obviously volunteering, but this is from Jasmine Bernard Brooks. How valuable and important is it to do professional training courses outside of the job? Is that something that employers will take particular interest in, or is it just a good add on? And I'd probably add to that what training courses are actually valuable to do. Well, I've only done training courses through the ICO, through the Independent Cinema Office, who offer really, really good bursaries to help you attend those courses. Um, the first one I did because the hub recommended that I do it, which was the programming course that I mentioned earlier, um, and the hub helped pay for me to do that. So I wasn't paying out of pocket. That was a really, really brilliant course. I don't know how frequently they run that or other kinds of courses like it, but if one of those ever pops up that's really worth doing and you should be able to get some money to help you do it um and then the other two I've done uh I did one when I was at the Brighton Film Festival was um developing your film festival which was yeah um my boss recommended that I go and do that course um on behalf of the festival and then I can't actually remember there was another course, but I can't actually remember what it is. Um, yeah, I think they are, for me, they've been really helpful. Um, but it, I only have my experience of within film exhibition, so I don't know what it's like across different parts of the film industry. Um, but I would definitely say that first course I did was was really, really invaluable. Yeah. And obviously, um, sign up for the ICO uh, newsletter that sends yeah. job opportunities. In oh, the, yeah. Get yourself like onto the, the ICO. Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. maybe in the chat, we'll have the link for that. But yeah. there's also in the chat, the link for Young Film Programmers newsletter. And if there are free training courses or you know anything related to getting in the industry as a programmer, then that will come through that newsletter as well. Yeah. But I think um, 
it's interesting that, you know, that question I would add, and I don't know what you would say, Kate, you know, maybe, again, not focusing on what the employer thinks of the training. What do you think of the training? Because I, yeah. I, you know, I did an MA in film studies, and I remember before that thinking, oh, what, what MA shall I do that will be good for my CV? And I went, go all through it, and then I thought, mm, yeah, but I'm really... Do I want to do that? Do I want to do business administration or whatever? You know, not to say there's anything wrong with that, but you know, and then I chose film studies. I thought, oh, I really enjoy that. And it was the best thing I ever did because it was for me. And that led to the passion growing. And that led to me getting into the industry. So I would just put on that, you know, maybe think, you know, obviously you have to think about employers, but if it comes from you first, I think, you know, Kate said it quite a lot. It's like the old, Robert Rodriguez thing you know for filmmakers don't say you're going to be a filmmaker it's just start making films it's like don't don't do things that you think the industry wants be more the driving force and then that authenticity will yeah. show itself and that maybe sounds naive but I think from what Kate has said it's it is the 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 kernel of most people who've got in the industry Yeah, I mean, I didn't have a plan for how to get where I am now. I'm still kind of amazed that I have gotten where I am now. Um, And I think what I did was just do the next thing that I thought seemed good. And that makes it sound like I haven't worked really hard. I have, but I also haven't been in a major rush to always get onto the next thing that I've you know I finished college I took some time out because I didn't know what I wanted to do at university so I just didn't go to university for a little bit I took two years out and then I went when I decided I thought I knew what I wanted to do and it wasn't because I could see a career path and it was part of a bigger plan it was just like I wanted to watch carry on watching films so I did film theory so yeah and then I did some jobs that weren't great and I didn't love and they weren't in film they were in other things and that was okay as well they they didn't work out stuff won't work out and then you just do something else you know it's not all going to be perfect there are going to be some little road road bumps and that's that's fine you don't need to be in a huge rush to be doing like the perfect job immediately because you probably won't do the perfect job immediately it doesn't work like that I think the way my experience has been presented in this session has been like and then I did this and I did this and I did this, but actually there've been a lot of little like side roads, um, which some of them haven't been great. So, but that's, that's fine. And that's really great to share. I think that it's more messy than the CV, you know, once, once you're looking <laughs> backwards, it all yeah. looks like it's made perfect sense, like a staircase. Yeah. But actually it was more organic than that. And you don't yeah. mention the dead ends and the cul-de-sacs but you learn from all of those things so yeah and, and Jay do you want to quickly say you know how's you how did your journey so far become you know organicized or you know how, was it organic or were you like right I'm going to do this and then this and then this and then this it was more of course you you think oh it'll be very smooth I, I will do this and that will lead on to that but it's it's more of I think I realize that I am slightly higher than where I was after that I and I, I look back and say oh yeah after I've applied for all of these jobs and opportunities and some of them have done some and some of them haven't and it's it's definitely not smooth there, there's probably I, I'd like to meet somebody who's just sailed on through it all I don't I don't think you I don't think they exist I don't probably not yeah no, I mean, it's like an overnight success is never an overnight success. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, there's a, a few questions we've got not long left, so I'm going to get through them. Um, from Kerise or Ceris again, um, this is kind of, we've covered it, but I just want to flag it again in case there's any more to be said, um, was if there's an opportunity to host screenings in my local indie cinema, any advice for this? I would love to hear more about the sessions run by the ICO. Well, get in touch with us. We can tell you how we can support you to go to that indie cinema, but to to both of our guests, uh, any advice on persuading them maybe? 
Um, sorry, Jay, you, you go ahead because you've got experience at depot of, of doing this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Jay had his, sorry, had their film screened um, at depot as a, a filmmaker as well as a programmer. So that's kind of an interesting sideline as well, but maybe that's a bit tangential. Sorry, yeah, Jay. I was going to say maybe with that one, I mean, you can always pay, you can always pay to do one. Um, I did pay to get my film screened and then had to do the advertising on the side. Um, and I did manage to fill three quarters of the, the room with that. So maybe you could use a similar sort of thing um, and pay for one screening, um, maybe screen a video drone like Kate did um, and see how many people you can get to attend this. And after you've paid for the screening, say to them or almost pitch it back to them say look I, I screened Videodrome it got 90 people came to see it maybe we could make something of this maybe we could do it again um, and you've got to sell again sell yourself um, but also use the experience that maybe you will gain in the future maybe you, you've said that you'll host this event and you've done one and see see if you can keep it going that would be how I'd approach it anyway yeah. yeah, I think it can be difficult if you're going straight into wanting to screen at a at a venue like a cinema because they they have I mean yeah we have so much stuff that we're trying to fit in all the time and and it can be nerve wracking to take a punt on someone who's just emailing you kind of cold calling you essentially. So I'd say rather than going straight to your indie, maybe go to other venues that put films on as part of you know at an art center or if they do their own pop-up screenings i know that there are loads of venues in brighton that do film screenings i'd say get in touch with them before you go straight to a cinema and then after you've got some experience there then take it to the cinema and say we'd like to take this to another level professionalize it a bit bring it into the cinema this is, and then you can point to the experience that you've had. And, and as Jay said, all of those like tickets that you sold for your screening of video drone, you can use that as evidence. Fantastic, thank you. A couple of quick ones. Ray Chung says, can you repeat the name of the voluntary program Kate just mentioned? Was that, I think the course maybe? Oh, oh well, I, the, there's a, I mentioned there's a volunteering program at Fabrica Gallery oh. in Brighton, but I don't know where you're based questioner but if you are based in Brighton then Fabrica are really really good to get involved with in a, in a voluntary capacity. And there's also one here from Daniel Rev what if I only have experience and put on screenings outside of the UK would employers consider these equal to work experience in the British film industry? Yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. just it just yeah treat it exactly the same because it is exactly the same you just did it in another country so yeah absolutely yeah yeah so I'm afraid we've run out of time, but, um, but we did have a couple more questions, but I think we, you know, they were kind of covered about experience and we talked a lot about that. So, you know, again, obvious way is young programmers or find a volunteer organization or do it yourself is always an option. Um, and then just finishing, the, I think we'd wrap it up there. It was just, you know, a couple of people said they weren't doing film. They're doing psychology or they're doing non-film. And how does that relate, do you think? So do you think I that's mean, a barrier or? I can, I can only speak to working in um, film and the arts. I have worked for arts organisations as well, like non-film arts organisations. So I'm, I imagine psychology might be a bit different, um, but I think a lot of it is like, you know, everything we said about CDs and how to talk about yourself and, um, and I don't know exactly in what ways you'd get yourself onto employers radars, but trying to work out how to get yourself onto their radar and make yourself known to them before applying, even if that's just getting in touch before you apply and just saying I'm going to apply and, and ask any questions that you might have about the application process, just get your name on their radar, I think, is, yeah. is my advice, but Sorry, I can't be more specific. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. So um, if there's that we didn't say also anything about interviews. So I'm just gonna do last question to you both. Any interview tips? Jay, do you want to go first? Um 
it's just show your passion. I I think, as I said before, the only reason I ended up with the job at the production company was just showing how much I loved the subjects that they made films about, that I, I love documentary. So name drop your favourite documentary filmmakers. Talk about these documentaries. You could even ask ask back questions, make it more conversational, make them realise that you fit in naturally. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, my, this is dorky, I use this really embarrassing website called Ask a Manager. This is a really, really good tip. Ask a man, I think it's askamanager.com and it's loads of advice about um, applying for jobs. It's, an, it's American, so it's kind, some of it is kind of like, doesn't feel culturally relevant or whatever. So you just have to kind of skip past some of that stuff. But they have loads of really, really good advice about preparing for interviews. Um, it's, yeah, it's embarrassing. It's kind of dorky. The whole process of applying for jobs is embarrassing. You have to get over that, um, basically. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 got loads of tips. So I, you know, kind of perfect actually because we don't have any time to go through the tips. So you can go go to Ask a Manager and look through that. But it's like a lot of preparation, unfortunately. Kind of going through what you think the questions are going to be, what your examples of those answers. You know, when they say have you got an example of the time that you did blah 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 you want to be able to reach for something really quickly and not be fumbling around. So you want to prepare beforehand. So yeah, do a lot of prep, write out your answers to stuff and um, look at this embarrassing website that I use. <laughs> and that's it. And yeah, just to add, you know, the experience and the specifics will really help you there yeah. in your interview. And then it's sort of that, yeah. you know, all, it all is the experience you've got, if yeah. good or bad. Yeah, examples. It can be bad, yeah. but you can yeah. learn a lot from the bad ones, yeah. if not yeah. more. Yeah. Got a point yeah. to examples. Yeah. And Jay, do you want the last word on your interview for Chalk Film Productions? Um, that that was it. It was it was just yeah. Tell them who tell them who you are, tell them what you're interested yeah. in. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, we run out of time. Thank you both so much. Uh, I feel like, wow, you know, <laughs> packed it all in, and lots of it, lots of uh, energy and enthusiasm. You, you know, it's it's all possible, basically. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of links in the chat for the ICO and for Young Film Programmers, which you can find on the ICO website. So if you are out there and you want to get some experience through Young Programmers, then get in touch we can help you whether there's a venue or not. And there's uh, the ICO newsletter is like a job uh, job notice Haven. for yeah. the exhibition industry. We can't, it will also maybe, you know, you can connect there with filmmaking jobs, but for exhibition, 100%, yeah. that's the go-to place. Um, thank you both for coming. Sorry, we've run over a little bit um, and for our little technical problems, but I just wanted to flag that Kate has given us some great suggestions for watching. So, you know, that's the foundation as well. Just watch those films and- Oh yeah, what watch talking about. everything. Yeah, just watch loads of stuff. So yeah, so you might wanna say quick, there's Caprice, 1987, Joanna Hogg's graduate film starring Tilda Swinton. Amazing on movie. Shirkers, Sandy Tan's documentary about the film she directed, which never got made, looks amazing. One of those hidden gems on Netflix that you need to be told. <laughs> uh, so yeah, shirkers, you have to look up and then it'll come. And the free one for BBC iPlayer Top Hat, Fred and Ginger, we love musicals. So <laughs> uh, sorry we didn't have much more time to say any of that. Jay, did you want to give us your top tip for watching before we sign off? Top tip for watching or what I'd, what I'd recommend? The film, the film recommendation. Um, Uncle Boon Me Who Can Recall His Past Lives on BFI Player. Great. I'm glad um, we got all of those in. So thank you so much for coming. See you next month, the last Wednesday of every month of the BFI Labs. Next one is Halloween special. So hope to see you there. Thanks for coming and thanks both Kate and Jay. <laughs>